al aire. Es un gusto darle la bienvenida al webinar. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the webinar Biofertilizers and other technologies available to face the fertilizer crisis in Latin America and the Caribbean. This webinar aims to present different options, a good uh, practices and lessons learned on the use and management of biofertilizers and other technological alternatives for the agricultural sector and which are currently available in order to face the crisis of high fertilizer prices. The concept of biofertilizers refers to biological fertilizers that provide plants with the nutrients necessary for their development while improving soil quality and helping to achieve a more natural microbiological environment. We hope that after knowing, learning these experiences that will be presenting the attendees, we will have a more complete picture about the context and the different options and potential of their application in the agricultural sector. Also, how they know about the different processes, planning and definition of public policies that are currently carried out from different national and regional initiatives by some countries and strategic partners. With this webinar, we mark the beginning of a series of conversations that we're preparing within the framework of the community of practice of soils for the region, a space where we connect with people linked to the subject to exchange knowledge and experiences. We will leave the contact, contact information for, more inf for, for further information about this in the chats and the different transmission channels. In these upcoming discussions prepared by the soil community, we will be reviewing the current situations of soil fertility and plant nutrition in Latin America and the Caribbean, alternative experiences for the management of soil fertility in the region, and then uh, end the cycle with public policies related to the issue. My name is Ana Posas and I will be moderating today's uh, day. I want to begin by greeting all, uh, our, our, our guests in particular. First, uh, His Excellency Mr. Juan Gonzalo Botero, Deputy Minister of Agricultural Affairs of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Colombia and his delegates to the Minister of Agriculture and Environment of the region uh, in this session and to the delegates and representatives. Mr. Julio Verdegué, FAO, Assistant Director General and Regional Representative for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mohamed A. Aida, FAO, Agriculture Officer, Plant Production and Protection Division. Mariangela Ongari da Cunha, researcher from Embrapa, Brazil. Gaio Sivdoxi, Senior Lecturer and uh, Vice Dean of Extension University of the West Indies. Juan Hircel, researcher of INIA, Quilamapu, Chile. Teodardo Calles, FAO Agriculture Officer, Plant Production and Protection Division. Francis Reyes, Technical Manager of BioM uh, Peru. Federico Poñante, Technician of the Secretary of Peasant and Indigenous of Family Agriculture of the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock and Fisheries of the Nation, Argentina. Marco Peixoto, Legislative Consultant to the Federal Senate of Brazil, and Edna Espinosa, leader to the Agricultural Inputs Group of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Colombia. As well as we'd like to welcome all the representative FAO offices in the region, academia, research institutes, pro producer associations, and uh, regional or global networks. To the members of the soil community of practice and the family farming and agroecology committee of practice, thank you very much to everyone for joining us. Please be welcome. We remind you that we're broadcasting this event with simultaneous interpretation into English. Um, it can be accessed through the FAO's YouTube channel from the www.fao.org, America's website, and also from our Twitter account at uh, FAO Americas. We invite you to comment on the event on social networks with the sustainable agriculture and biofertilizer. We also invite attendees to leave questions in the chats of our social networks and in the chat of our Zoom platform, which we will try to answer during the question and answer uh, block. We suggest that you indicate your name and the name of the panelist to whom the question is addressed. Let's begin today with the initial message from the Assistant Director General and FAO Regional Representative of Latin America and the Caribbean, Mr. Julio Verdegué. You're recognized. Thank you, Ana. First of all, let me welcome you and let me thank you all, the Vice Minister and all the distinguished uh, panel members that will be 
sharing their opinions and recommendations and inputs, especially their solutions, emphasis on solutions. We're here because Latin America and the Caribbean, like the rest of the world, well, we are a bit of a crisis, uh, a food crisis. In different countries, it's uh, more or less severe with uh, different uh, uh, forms and manifestations. But for the first time in, in decades, the bulk of the countries and the planet, regardless of uh, developing uh, develop big powers, we're all facing a big threat. We got used to, well, many of us at least, uh, with the privilege of having a, a meal every day, that every day our food will be available at the table. And also, fortunately, we've got used to especially younger people, to live in a world where inflation was not a big matter of concern in most countries. Today, these two factors are not so, are no longer that way. The last numbers I've seen out of 24 countries, which we have information, in Latin America and the Caribbean, 17 out of 24 have inflation rate just for food, 10% um, or higher per year, 10% or higher, an increase in the food prices in the last 12 months, 17 out of 24 countries. This is a threat, first of all, to our wallet, our ability to buy food for millions. Uh, 267 people in our region that before these crises were living in, in a food insecurity and nutritional insecurity condition. This increase is dramatic. If they would eat bad and poor, that situation is getting worse. And uh, we will have a number of people that are living in, in famine condition. For many others who were not going through this condition are at risk of going into this uh, food insecurity condition. This uh, situation is even worse uh, because this is caused by a strong, dramatic increase, 151% on world average in the last year, the price of fertilizers. Farmers, especially small and middle family farmers, <coughs> will have a real hard time to produce seed. Uh, the, the same thing they were doing before. With these production costs, there are huge segments uh, of agriculture that uh, have no access to uh, funding. They have to self-finance uh, their crops. And with these production costs, most probably, these, they will be induced to reduce the size of their crops or use less fertilizers and therefore reduce productivity, which will only worsen the, the inflation, uh, food insecurity. That is uh, a very challenging situation. That's why we call it a crisis. A crisis, when, uh, when you write uh, these concepts in Chinese, is represented by two symbols two characters. One, the first of them means hazard, danger. The other one is risk. That's why we are here in this seminar, because a crisis has to become an opportunity to move towards an agriculture, not only today, but also thinking in the mid and long term, an agriculture which will be less dependent on synthetic fertilizers. That does not mean zero, but less reliant on uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers. If there is a lesson we have received from these crisis situations that we cannot only rule uh, agriculture 
based on a single criteria of better efficiency. Efficiency is important, but we also have to address other concepts that has to be equally important, which is called greater resilience. So today, we're here to find solutions that will allow us to face in the short term the lack and the high price of fertilizers, but also in the mid and long term will allow us to move towards a more sustainable and more resilient agriculture. At FAO, we're working on this, and let me close, Anna. We're focused on one idea, solutions, solutions. We don't want to spend time on the diagnosis and analysis and on, on, on the big concepts. Our farmers, our consumers, and particularly those in the food insecurity condition, famine, small family farmers, governments are trying to find what to do. And this is the point. That is our expectation. Offer everyone, the whole Latin American and, and Caribbean community, solutions to face these high cost of fertilizers and move towards a more sustainable and resilient agriculture. Thank you, and I hope we'll have a great meeting. Thank you, Mr. Verdegui. We had now the remarks from the, the Vice Minister, Juan Gonzalo Botero, who is the Vice Minister of uh, Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development in Colombia, but he had a, uh, a connection problem. So uh, let me share with you, Latin America and the Caribbean are the key position to face the... Anna, Anna, Anna. No, he's, he's ready. Mr. Botero is ready. Okay, so on to the welcome remarks. Um, the, His Excellency Juan Gonzalo Botero, Vice Minister of uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development of Colombia. Mr. Botero, you are recognized. Mr. Botero, probably your microphone is, uh, it seems we have an audio feed uh, difficulty. He says we have to accept him or authorize him to open his microphone. Probably he has been accepted as a guest, not as a panelist. Mr. Vice Minister, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Greetings, uh, Dr. Bertege and all those uh, in the session uh, today in this important seminar. I believe, like Julio said, Julio has uh, clearly explained the situation of uh, fertilizers and input uh, for agriculture in Latin America. That's why let me share with you what uh, we have been doing in Colombia to face this crisis. We've uh, uh, seen this, uh, we have uh, done several things in the legal framework where last year we submitted to our Congress a bill which was passed to establish a, a national framework of uh, agriculture and livestock system. This system has four major elements. A general observatory of inputs, which will provide the necessary information for decision making. A board, a national board, with all the entities, uh, producers, uh, traders of inputs, where we discuss the decisions uh, made. A national committee 
with representatives uh, from the government setting the general policies and uh, and an important instrument, namely the National Fund for access to uh, inputs. And this fund aims at the possibility for the producers to have support and tools to access inputs in the domestic market. This is a uh, law promoting the use of biofertilizers and bioinputs in the country, aiming at what you said, uh, at the ecological transition of our agriculture into a more sustainable and uh, environment-friendly system. And in compliance with this mandate, with our national research center, we are completing a study which shows that if we use uh, the livestock waste production, we could replace up to 62% of the artificial fertilizers we're using. We're also working at the diplomatic level, allowing us to guarantee the supply of fertilizers globally. And from that standpoint, we have important uh, actions with uh, Morocco, uh, United uh, Arab Emirates, for nitrogen-based uh, fertilizers and Canada for potassium-based uh, fertilizers. Third of all, we adopted actions with uh, domestic uh, producers and we adopted uh, measures to reduce down to zero those uh, tariffs levied on uh, agricultural livestock inputs as well as their blends that in order to reduce costs and gain access of producers to agricultural and livestock inputs and uh, uh, an ongoing communication with the distribution companies uh, we have uh, locally so as to so as to have an ongoing monitoring of the status and quantity of inputs they have to guarantee the supply of them throughout the year with that uh, we hope that uh, we will have, uh, we will build a proper inventory and that cost may be affordable for producers. And to avoid what uh, Julio just said, that because of a lower application or use of fertilizer, we might reduce productivity of crops. These are the actions uh, we would and we would expect an international action or mandate uh, 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 that uh, we will have uh, that we can have uh, an important position in the international market as Latin American countries so as to keep the stability and make that uh, and to avoid as much as possible the uh, famine uh, threat and the uh, food insecurity. Thank you, Julio. And uh, I hope I've just uh, contributed uh, with the Colombian actions so that uh, all the countries can implement them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Botero. Yes, your participation has contributed for the seminar and to adopt the options that Mr. Julio commented before. 
without a doubt, Latin America and the Caribbean has a position where they can face the challenges related to the rising of the prices of fertilizers, the offer and the lack of fertilizers in, food, in the food industry through technologies, through tools and decision making for the use of biofertilizers fertilizers and other alternatives. The region can consolidate its role as an exporter if for fertilizers in the food industry and also can face the crisis of fertilizers and move forward in a more sustainable agriculture. Let's go for the third participation today. I would like to give the floor for Mr. Mohamed Eida. He's official in the agriculture sector, specialist in nutrition and plant nutrition of the FAO. He will present the impact and the answers for the high prices of fertilizers. Mr. Eida, you have 15 minutes for your presentation, please. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So thank you for you. Thank you all for invitation me today to speak. So I will start to share my uh, screen for the uh, presentation. So uh, I hope you can uh, see my presentation now. Not so, yet, Mohamed. Yes. So my presentation title is Impact and Possible Response to High Fertilizer uh, Prices. And for the uh, first slide, I want to show the uh, how the change in the fertilizer prices during the last year. So from the beginning of last year, the uh, 20, 2021, the fertilizer prices... Sorry, Mohamed. Yes. Sorry, Mohamed. We can see the presentation yet. Uh, Are uh, you sharing it? Yes, I'm sharing. Yes. So, So you can see it now? It's coming, I think. Yes. Would you please, pre in presentation mode? Yes. Thank you. It's okay. So the, in, the title is Impact and Possible Response to the High Fertilizer uh, Prices. And the uh, first the slide, I want to show the change in the uh, fertilizer prices during 2021 which increased sharply from the uh, the beginning of June to uh, the uh, Jan January 1st of the uh, 21, maybe increased to uh, the double. And this increase in the fertilizer prices during this year was re uh, regarding to the increase in the, the uh, prices of the uh, energy sources, which increased from 20, 20 to more than 100 uh, US dollar per barrel. And then, uh, the small figure in to the right show the uh, impact of the Russian-Ukrainian uh, conflict on the prices of the uh, fertilizers, which resulted in more increase at the Russia, uh, one of the major producer and the exporter for the uh, the fertilizers, and this after this uh, conflict, the prices of nitrogenous uh, uh, fertilizers increased to reach over than one hundred one thousand dollar. Uh, per metric metric ton, and this uh, prices uh, increased more uh, because of this uh, conflict. So next, to, next, I want to show the regional consumption, which can give indication how the different region can be uh, impacted by the uh, increase in fertilizer prices. So in Asia, the major regional fertilizer consumption it, uh, it consumes over than 50% of the global uh, fertilizers. And this can indicate the significant shakes could be happened regarding that this increase of the uh, fertilizers. While in Africa, the lowest uh, fertilizer uh, consumption indicate more stability and, and less uh, less shakes happen because the, the, the accessibility and the, uh, the, the consumption is low, uh, while other regions it can be affected in similar way, for example, in Latin America and Caribbean, consume 13%, around 13% of, uh, uh, of the global fertilizer in the world. And the figure in the left show the, the brechets or procurement for fertilizer in different regions, and also it can be explained by the, the consumption, like we can see here the, the uh, larger 
uh, uh, larger procurement in Latin America uh, and in uh, in Asia Pacific and then Africa. Asia Pacific, of course, uh, of course, because of the high consumption in Africa, uh, because of the low uh, availability of the fertilizers, and because of this uh, situation in fertilizers. The global situation can be varied from place to another, and some countries make some, take some measure to mitigate the uh, the impact of fertilizers on the countries. Uh, at the global perspective, the uh, the the exporting countries reduce the uh, the exportation of fertilizer to to guarantee the uh, availability of the fertilizer in the market. In Asia, for example, the major market. In Asia, like India, increase the financial support through subsidiaries to uh, afford to uh, to make to increase the availability of the fertilizer to the farmers and and guarantee the production. In Europe, the uh, the, the farmer can can, uh, can can reach the fertilizers and pay for for the fertilizer, but the increase in 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 uh, and these prices will will be affect the prices of the uh, food, which is already uh, high. In Africa, the major problem, as I mentioned before, is the availability and the accessibility. In in several places, especially in the uh, Latin America and and Caribbean area, in the uh, the 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 suppliers finding the, the supply of the uh, fertilizers the limited supply and the transportation will affect the uh, prices of the fertilizers so uh, so the major challenge in different area uh, by regions we can find in asia the overuse is a major challenge and also uh, low co low prices of some uh, base, some uh, commodity crops like rice uh, may reduce the affordability of the fertilizers in Europe. Some uh, plants that produce uh, fertilizers are closed because of the high uh, energy cost, and this also will uh, will reflect to the uh, the the cost of the the food in Africa. Uh, as I mentioned before, the un underuse. Because the the low availability and and accessibility to fertilizer, also the uh, the the farmers are less practiced to apply and the and the manipulate the the fertilizers. Transportation cost is very high uh, in Latin America and Caribbean. Limited supply, transportation, uh, transportation and logistic cost could affect the the, uh, the 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 production of food and and oil crops and also affect impact the food security in near east and, and northern africa the main challenge in this area is the uh, low efficient use of fertilizers so what is the response to the high fertilizer cost sustainable plant production sustainable plant nutrition could produce could provide uh, appropriate way to uh, to to face the fertilizer high prices uh, through fertilizer improving fertilizer use efficiency and management and uh, improving the nutrient recycling and reuse with improving the the soil fertility and providing the required policies and regulation to guarantee the sustainable uh, plant production, the uh, plant nutrition. And in this regard, FAO uh, developed the code of fertilizers, which present uh, the framework, framework to uh, for the sustainable plant uh, nutrition. And, and for recommendation, uh, as we mentioned, it is important uh, to, to, to introduce uh, recommendations and, and solutions to improve the, uh, we have six recommendations, uh, some of them to improve the efficient use of fertilizers and use of alternatives of fertilizers. So for improving the uh, fertilizer use efficiency, the four R's, a nutrient stewardship, can, can help in this respect and also using the alternatives to mineral fertilizers, biofertilizers and biosimulants, a utilization of uh, slow release and controlled released fertilizers, uh, follow, uh, follow intergrouping and crop rotation system, also some recommendations to uh, industrial sector. So the first recommendation to the farmer and the crop production sector is following the four R's nutrition stewardship which is uh, 
help to improve the fertilizer use efficiency by selecting the uh, right fertilizer source, uh, which consider the type of groups and the, and the type of soil, such uh, soil, soil characteristics like the pH and other soil characteristics. And also application, uh, the second R is uh, right application rate, the right rate. And this right uh, rate uh, can uh, to ensure uh, not applying or not adding excess uh, fertilizer to the soil. And this, uh, in this respect, also uh, doing the soil soil analysis test to to determine the uh, the nutrient status of soil can help to improve uh, and select the uh, the the right application rate. Also, the the third R is right time uh, to apply to apply the fertilizer in the correct time to, to blend required fertilizers and in in this in this right arm also uh, following splitting uh, splitting the the application doses and fertilizers do, to different dose is better than one dose application and in this selecting the time of the fertilizer application should uh, consider the blend growth rate and also uh, doing uh, blend tissue test can help to determine the blend requirement of the, the nutrient. And last R for the four R's is applying the fertilizer to the right place. Right place mean uh, applying soil, applying fertilizer to large space of uh, large area of soil decrease the efficiency of the fertilizer. So applying fertilizer to uh, close to the, uh, the the roots zone of the plant increase the plant, the uh, fertilizer efficiency to these crops. And the second recommendation is uh, using the alternatives to mineral fertilizers, which is could be uh, organic fertilizers and organic manure, this or, and compost, and this type of fertilizer produ uh, provide plant with nutrient. Uh, also, this type of uh, fertilizers enhance the microbial community in soil, which help in the uh, improving the the nutrient nutrient availability and uh, and uh, nutrient availability for the plant. And also we can improve this type of fertilizers uh, by following uh, good practice for compost, composting and also using machinery to uh, distribute this fertilizer can improve the efficiency. Also, uh, utilization of this manure could help to improve the, uh, the efficient efficiency of these uh, fertilizers. The next one is the, the, the main topic of this uh, webinar today uh, is the utilization of biofertilizers and biosimulants. And in this, uh, microorganisms can play a vital role to provide plants with the uh, important nutrients for, and in, if in, in, in good amounts, for example, uh, in this table, we can see the, uh, the rhizobia in the symbiotic relationship with the with the legumes and the pulses can fix nitrogen up to uh, 300 kilogram per hectare per year also we can find another type of microorganisms which can uh, fix nitrogen nitrogen is the main uh, nutrients which is not found in the soil so uh, it is important to provide this uh, element so uh, Azotobacter isosparillum and the blue-green algae can fix nitrogen and provide plants uh, other than legumes with its, its, its requirement from the, uh, the nitrogen. Also, some other uh, microorganisms can play a, a great role to the improve the, the, the availability of nutrients like uh, bacillus that increase the availability of phosphorus and all the other micronutrients. Uh, beside that, the mycorrhiza fungi, mycorrhiza fungi, which is considered the, the, as the secondary roots for the plant, and then and it ex extend the, uh, the 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 accessibility of plant to rich uh, water and 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 the nutrients from uh, from uh, far parts from the soil, and that also increases the 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 efficient use of. Uh, of fertilizers and also this this type of microorganisms not, not only provide nutrients also can provide plant growth uh, promoters and also can work at the biological control agents. 
And the next, the next, the next one is the utilization of the uh, of the slow release and controlled release the fertilizers, which is remains uh, expensive technology. So we can find it uh, utilized in developed country like the states, Japan, and and Europe. And this the technology of this fertilizer based on releasing the nutrients uh, according to the plant the plant uh, requirement. And in and slow rate, so it, it helps to uh, improve the uh, fertilizer use efficiency as well. So the next the next recommendation is following intergrouping and the group rotation. And the, through this uh, recommendation, we, we it, it could be recommended to integrate uh, groups with high uh, with high nutrient requirements. With another groups that have high, has low uh, low requirement of nutrients, or other than or or others like legumes and bulbs that can fix nitrogen and provide uh, nutrients to the next the the next uh, the next group. And this following this technology reduce the the reliance on the the mineral fertilizers through this uh, application. And the last, the last recommendation of my presentation today is to the industrial sector to uh, increase the uh, the investment for developing and the production of alternative to mineral uh, fertilizers such as organic fertilizers in good quality and and biofertilizer as well as a smart smart fertilizers including slow release uh, fertilizers and. Uh, nano uh, fertilizer. So this I'm um, I'm going to the end of my presentation and thank you very much for your interest. Gracias, eh, Mohamed, por thank you, Mohamed, for putting the global situation into context and uh, for showing as an alternative to the solutions uh, we have available to face discussions. Before we go into the agenda. We have a simultaneous interpretation to English and Spanish. To select the language of your preference, you have to click on at the bottom of the screen. In uh, there's a world icon, and there you can uh, select the language of uh, at, at at your convenience. Next, uh, in our agenda. We will go to uh, Gaio Seudoxi, he's a full professor uh, of uh, University of West Indies. Uh, he, uh, opportunities to sustainably improve the health of tropical soils. So, Gaio, so you have 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, our panelists, as well as our attendees, and uh, let me uh, certainly express my thanks uh, to the FU for uh, hosting this particular um, webinar on a very uh, important topic. So just bear with me as I share uh, my screen. Wonderful. So I'm hoping that you can see my screen. And I just want to take you through particularly our Caribbean experience and our, from a Caribbean perspective, uh, aspects pertaining to uh, sustainably managing some of our tropical soils. And I want to um, indicate from the onset, uh, our tropical soils may be a little different, well, except our, our mainland territories such as Guyana, uh, Suriname, and as well uh, Belize, but our tropical soils uh, tend to not be uh, of the oxy soil or of the, uh, for a soil class, uh, but more so along that line. So most of those soils tend to be highly inherently degraded. And there is a, a need for us to think about the biofertilizers and these types of sustainable uh, organic amendments, not only from the perspective of uh, what is happening now with regards to supply and demand from uh, commercial and synthetic fertilizers, but we must also see from the perspective as well as in terms of building resilience and building uh, uh, the opportunities for us to adapt to uh, a changing climate and also to ensure that the health of that particular soil uh, remains or improves uh, such that that soil can continue to provide us 
uh, the sustenance uh, that we require and our generations to come also require. So through this particular presentation, I'm hoping to share with you a little bit of the characteristics, particularly of our soils uh, in the Caribbean, some of the major challenges those soils uh, possess. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we address some of those uh, soil health challenges, uh, particularly with some work that we are currently doing and that we have done and is being uh, also uh, expanded across the region. I want to specifically mention the importance of organic amendments as a sustainable soil management practice, particularly for uh, our tropical soils. And I also want to touch a little bit on uh, microbial technology, some of the work that has been done, some of the successes, and the opportunities that remain for us uh, within uh, that newfound uh, technology. So our soils within the Caribbean are very broad based. Uh, we have soils across all the soil orders uh, that are currently recognized. And uh, a former emeritus professor of ours, Professor Nazir Ahmad from uh, Guyana, and I noted we have several participants from Guyana, um, classified our soils during the 1960s and 70s during a survey that was done uh, in, in combination with the uh, United States Department of Agriculture in six major categories. Out of those six major categories, which are, are really temporal in nature, um, or geologic in nature as well, there are a few of those particular um, classes of soils that tend to be more problematic yeah, than others. And they are widespread uh, throughout our region. And they are soils that I would want to, to touch on because they are those soils that are inherently poor, of um, very low quality. And when we use them, we typically find that the uh, outputs from those soils are, com are particularly um, compromised. And the essence is that the, the philosophy has always been to add more and more of the uh, synthetic inputs into the soils as a strategy, a traditional strategy for improving the soils. And we have seen, and hopefully I'll be able to explain to our, our um, attendees here, the fact that sometimes that may not be the best approach to take. So I have singled out uh, soils derived from our older freshwater sediments, and these soils are, I will describe in a little while, are some of the uh, poor soils that we have um, in the region. Now, what makes a tropical soil? A tropical soil has, in my mind, when it comes to, in terms of health, two key characteristics that are really important for us to stress on. One, the fact is in the tropics, we have high temperatures throughout the year. So that these high temperatures uh, result in high degradation and the inability of our soils to build up organic matter contents. So most of the soils in the region outside of those that are generally submerged tend to have uh, what we call upland soils tend to have less than 2% organic matter. And we know the importance of organic matter as a soil health uh, in the sea. So that's one of the constraining features. The other one is the fact that we are in a, a tropical environment where it rains a lot. So in addition to the temperature, we have moisture again, two of the critical elements for uh, rapid degradation. And as such, our soils tend to be devoid of that uh, inherent feature of organic carbon that is necessary. And we know it as the lifeblood of our soils. So those soils that I am going to focus on uh, really occur um, in, in high rainfall areas. They are very leached. They are, have significant amounts of um, profile development. I will show it in a little while. Uh, it features a, a density area. So in addition to having to worry about the lack of fertility or the infertility and acidity of those soils, we also have to worry about the fact that um, sexually they are stratified and it creates tremendous problems with regards to water management also in these soils. So those soils are particularly troublesome uh, from a management perspective. And here I have a, a very wonderful uh, photo of our Professor Emeritus here uh, explaining uh, to a group of participants the issues that we have in terms of managing these types of tropical soils. Um, it's an earthy soil by, by um, order, if you think about the USDA classification. And you can clearly see in this soil, it's where this soil photo was taken is in a very active agricultural community uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. So the air horizon is already a plowed horizon. So it's, it's a, a horizon that is active in terms of um, being um, manipulated 
uh, via agricultural implements. And right below that gray layer, you see this bleached horizon, which is that inuviated or leach zone. And below it, we start to see a mortal zone that is typically represented by higher clay contents. So not only do those farmers in those areas here suffer from the fact that they have an infertile acid soil that they have to deal with, they also have the problem of the fact that it has an impeded um, zone that prevents water from draining uh, during our intense rainfalls, such as uh, we are uh, encountering right now. So these soils are tremendously challenging for us to address. So yes, the, our soils in the region have very poor health to begin with because of the two critical elements of uh, environmental elements of high rainfall and um, uh, elevated temperatures. When that is combined now with the fact that our practices, our agricultural practices remain extremely unsustainable. Uh, we do uh, follow mainly uh, a monoculture type um, uh, cropping experience. And even when we don't follow a monoculture type cropping experience, uh, we do uh, disturb the soil every time we crop. And our crops are generally three months uh, long. Uh, annual base crop. So we do that almost three to four times per year. And because these soils already are poor health, they have low resilience. So that low resilience means that the more we disturb them, the more we encourage further degradation, further erosion. And essentially, we have a cycle where farmers come back to say, you know, I've been planting on this soil for 10 years. And each year, no matter what I do, no matter how many inputs I put, I get new one yields. And it is something that we have to recognize that is intrinsic in the nature of our urban soils in the tropics. And it's something that we have to think about in terms of how do we improve the resilience? How do we improve the uh, soil health? Some of the other constraints that we face is the low technology use. Within the Caribbean, our farming systems are identified. Mugai, you do have one minute, please. Oh, sure. So our is identified as, um, uh, being um, of low technology because we have a lot of small farmers and those small farmers typically create uh, or don't have the finance to generate uh, significant amounts uh, of uh, technology or use significant amount of technology. So what I want to quickly show is the importance of using soil organic matter and what that could do uh, with regards to improving on these very same soils. So we did some studies that showed from two perspectives I want to bring it very quickly. One being from the um, soil health perspective of pH, and we showed that from utilizing farmyard compost as well as um, brewer spend grain as an amendment to the soil was very important, particularly with regards to the rates. Importantly, in these degraded soils, the rates are particularly important. Traditional rates do not result in the kind of improvements that we want. So higher rates of about 200 um, pages per hectare uh, what we are recommending. And we also see that strongly with regards to the organic um, content of the soil, the soil organic carbon content. Higher rates are preferable to uh, ensuring that you have some amount of improvement. What we also saw though quickly is that they, the, the, because these soils are inherently quickly degraded, we have to have that as a sustainable practice. It has not only to be uh, a short-term practice. It has to be consistently that we're doing that over a number of years. We also get the benefit of compost biodiversity when we add these organic matter, because we know that our compost brings in both fungal and bacterial beneficial communities. So it also serves as a biofertilizer. So I will end on this particular slide. I'm sorry that I had to move a little fast. I didn't realize the time was moving on me. Some of the things we also saw is that we did a study of indigenous microbes in these same soils. And we were able to see that there are phosphate solubilizing microbes present in these soils that have the ability, when applied as an inoculant, to improve the uh, availability and uptake of phosphorus uh, via microscope studies. So there are lots of opportunities for us to think about in moving uh, the technology uh, further. But I just want to end by stressing the importance of when we think about these technologies, about utilizing organic um, amendments, utilizing commercial biofertilizers, we also have to think about how is that going to work within the nutrient stewardship portfolio. 
are we doing it to ensure that that soil benefits? Thank you so very much, Chair. Muchas gracias, Gallos, a usted y socialmente y por socializar. Gallos, and especially for showing us the options that we have in the Caribbean. Thank you very much for your presentation. We will then follow with our agenda. And for those people that are having a little bit of difficulty with the translation from English to Spanish or Spanish to English, we have an icon in the lower tab of your screen. Please select on that icon. What is the language that you would like to hear? And also for the presentations that will be available on the website. We will follow up then with Maria Angela Ungria da Cunha. She is an investigator of Mbapa Brazil, and she will talk in her presentation about the growth, uh, plant growth, and uh, inoculant productions. Maria Angela, you have 15 minutes, please. Maria Angela, no podemos escucharla por Maria Angela, we can't hear you. Can you please check that your microphone is open? Josefina, uh, somebody is telling me there is a problem with the translation. Yes. So, I would like to present in English and I will try to speak in Portuñol. I will talk about a bacteria that promote plant growth and the opportunities to produce uh, with sustainability. Plants need nutrients. Why? Because it is not a forest which is balanced where we have cycling nutrients, we have leaves here and then the plants take advantage of the minerals. But apart from that, the ancestral plants are have different needs compared to the modern plants. Therefore, to have a modern agriculture, we have to add fertilizers, but the fertilizers have a few issues. First, low efficiency because of the use of the plant. For example, nitrogen in a maximum of 50%, it is lost by gases, by leach. Or for first, for example, it is included in our soils, but plants get uh, out of 15% of it and potassium out of 50, 60%. The fertilizers have a few issues which are contamination issues of water and air. And in many countries, for example, like Brazil, Brazil is an agricultural country, but we are facing a huge crisis because we import today 85% of, of the fertilizers that we use. What are then the alternatives, especially right now in, when we're facing this fertilizer crisis, we, we have to use microorganisms that can promote growth of the plants. And we have many opportunities here now I'm going to talk about potassium, uh, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and also products that are already in the market in Brazil today with access to the farmers and can be included in all of the countries of Latin America. First nutrient that is the most important in economically speaking for Brazil that we import and is the most expensive one is nitrogen but we have biological fixing of nitrogen that can add in different levels, be it the highest level of, of fixation in plant ve vegetables, in, in legumes, and also in areas where they can add incredible quantities of 230 kilograms of nitrogen by hectare. In Brazil, we have microbiologists that have always worked with the fixing of nitrogen. And we have a tradition of over 60 years of use of the fixing of nitrogen, biological fixing of nitrogen with legumes, and now a market of more than 90 million doses 
for nitrogen and also it's the soy crops and there's inoculant with other high quantity of legumes it is important we're talking about 90 million it is a lot for soy but this was from one day to another no it doesn't happen from one day to another a success story of the fixing of nitrogen in soy in brazil many it, it was due of many years of investigation and studies here you have a story of soy in brazil that took over 50 years to have what we have today the results that we have today so soy is exotic in brazil so we didn't have this legume and we didn't have also the strains but some microbiologists brought some strains from the united states and australia and started to study it to be able to select those that could adapt more to the conditions in, in brazil and the studies never finished and it, it is interesting to note here that in the 60s when we started to the studies with fixing these trains could bring all of the nitrogen to soy with a capacity of 1000 kilos by hectares that were produced so until today with crops of 8000 kilos of nitrogen per hectare they start they still give positive results we haven't stopped studying and investigating and an, an example that is very clear that we should look for each biome and each environment in itself is that we have to persist in the investigation and studies and we can see that for tropical conditions if we add if we bring strains every year for something that we call annual inoculation or re-inoculation we can have a growth a medium growth of in grains of eight percent which is very important and look you can see here in the graph we i don't need to add nitrogen on fertilizers and i get a rise of eight percent so this is the reality in brazil and look at the reality of the united states that they didn't persist with the investigation of fixing of nitrogen they don't use re-inoculation and they say that to have the same quantity of rise of the results per year they have to add uh, uh, almost 1000 kilos of nitrogen per hectare so this is an environmental problem it is an environmental problem and economical problem as well so we have to persist in the investigations and studies for example in brazil we have the industry of uh, nitrogen and fertilizers and every year we're there to is investigating the to show the farmers that it is not necessary to apply nitrogen so here when we we did an experiment in 1997 showing that 500 kilos or zero kilos of re-inoculation happened and then 20 years later we still do investigation and experiments to show the farmer that is not necessary to apply nitrogen. Not so many countries in the world do this. Look, 300 field trials in 30 years, but we have to keep teaching the farmer what is necessary. And if we see that something happens, do some trials and investigation and correct it today we have a very privileged position in brazil brazil is the main producer of soy in the world but this we could only get there because of nitrogen fixing that adds all of the nitrogen to soybean production and thank to the thanks to the studies and investigations while country like united states china need to keep adding nitrogen and we talk about this every year to farmers and now we have a medium of 80 percent of brazilian farmers that use inoculant for soybeans every year and when all of the farmers comply with the results and they see that they can save in fertilizers they ask for more and this is how they ask for things for example cereals and uh, 
wheat and corn, and we could select and identify strains of Azospirillium brasiliensis for corn and for wheat. And these strains that we selected also have the capacity of nitrogen fixing, not like a legume, is like 20, 25% of plants, of what plants need, but nitrogen is so expensive and uh, it's harmful for the environment that if it were only 5%, it would still be good. And these strains have a amazing capacity of producing phytohormones. It's more roots, which is more roots is um, taking advantage of fertilizers and taking advantage of water and gives more tolerance to the plant when facing stress. So we have the first strains for Zopirilmum for corn and for wheat. And we saw a rise, a very interesting rise in the um, grains, in the cereals. And also the first inoculant was, uh, in, we saw it in Brazil in 2009. And the first, here we have the first study when we did a trial that we found that was published in Brazil with more 103 field trials that confirmed a rise, a medium, a average rise of 5.4% of, of corn grains. And it is positive and is statistically confirmed. And look at this number here, which is important. It is 12.1% in the growth of the root. More root means everything. So in just 10 years, we have 10 million doses of inoculant. Why is this important, especially in when we're facing such a fertilizing crisis? Uh, the, here we have an experience with nitrogen where we could do a follow-up of where the nitrogen is going. Look in the case of corn, 100 of nitrogen that was put into the corn. The, with the plant found that without the bacteria took advantage of only 34% of this nitrogen. So for the most part, it was lost. And with the bacteria here, it went up for to 58% of um, the use of the fertilizer. So it was an increment of 70%. So we have microorganisms that we can take advantage of something, can take advantage of something that is more so in, expensive in the worlds that we're facing nowadays, like the war of Ukraine and Russia that is affecting all of the country. And the nitrogen is an element that is the element that we study the most in our lab. And when we have more roots, we take the plant gets advantage of potassium and phosphorus. And as we're talking of phosphorus, which is something that is very critical in Brazil, our soils, and generally speaking, are very poor in phosphorus. We have launched not long ago an inoculant for phosphorus. These are bacteria that produce phytohormones, incrementing the growth of the root roots. So it was a 15 year study to be able to identify these two strains of Bastilos, which show a difference in phosphorus. The first inoculant of phosphorus that we could see in Brazil was not long ago in 2019. And today we have more than 4 million hectares in that used bacillus, they have, the farmers have accepted this inoculant quite well, that can help a lot the the advantage of phosphorus. So we have red, we have here use in uh, corn, soybean and sugarcane. And we found out that we were thinking that legumes okay and ostraminias okay, but no, let's talk a little bit in a mix of microorganisms that can sh that we can share that has a different microbiome process that can add much more to the plant. So we did the re-inoculation with the soybean and also with um, beans and it was to mix the rhizoba which was an industry of nitrogen fertilizer and also with azospirillum with an industry of phytohormones so the rise average rise of soybeans that we were planting in old areas that had a population of 8.4 percent doubled it went up to 16.1 percent and this inoculant mixed the 
Rizzo Bianos Felinio went out, launched the market in 2013, 2014 for the first time. And look what we have as a result in only five years, a little over five years, we have now 25% of all of the area that plant soybean in Brazil. This is more than 10 million hectares in Brazil. And a result of a meta-analysis of trials, of five-year trials that we have, trials we gather from other colleagues, we have a rise in more than 11% in the roots and also in the total of uh, the studies of the roots. So here, what would we see in the future? The perspective we have more uh, a rise in biological products than in chemical products. For us that we work with biological products, this is a great, great news for us. But what we, what do we await? What does the future await for us? The use of multifunctional microorganisms. Plants have a lot of needs, so we will have a mix of inoculants with microorganisms with molecules, microbiome molecules, we will have a lot of use of biological products. Secondly, we should think of integrated systems for microorganisms. People that live in tropical areas, all of the year we live in tropical years, we don't have snow or, or cold, so we have crops throughout the whole year. We have to think what we're going to use. Now we need a little bit of Modazos pinilo, a Rizoglos, a Bacillus to be able to control a disease. So we have to have a program, a schedule of use of biological products. We should also have in mind how to take advantage, internationally speaking, the use of microorganisms to mitigate the emissions of GHG using less chem chemicals. How are we going to take advantage of this international speaking? How are we going to present our image uh, for the gas emissions? Because this mitigates a lot the by the use of microorganisms. So how also as social services linked to microorganisms because it lowers the costs for farmers and lowers the costs also results in increasing the money to be able to improve lifestyle and also human health and in the next years just like modern medicine has solved a lot of issues. And today we are talking about microbiome, which are the results of diseases as, as well that can also cure us of many diseases. Today, the microbiomes save people that have generalized infection in ho that are hospitalized and in the same, in the last person that presented was talking about this as well. How are we going to face this in plants? We're going to use more the microbiomas of plants and soils. And of course, we hope to improve the production of the crops with sustainability. So beautiful stories like the one I just told you today regarding soybeans come from a mix of investigation studies industry legislations and agricultures and we have here the position of brazil today which is the country that works with fixing nitrogen in with soybean and this gives us the prices of the nitrogen to fertilizers per year of almost 42 billion dollars per year this is more than 1300 and twenty dollars per second and it is so important this what we're saving here while doing fixed nitrogen we're not also emitting co2 because of the use of the nitrogen fertilizer thank you very much thank you uh, mary angela First of all, thank you for the emphasis on trying to find integrated system-wide uh, solutions, but also for emphasizing the role of, uh, of researchers in looking for alternatives in the generation of information that will allow for informed decision-making. Thank you so very much. So next, uh, Mr. Juan Hirsel with the INIA Quilamapu of Chile. 
it will present uh, technical specifications and correct use of organic amendment as an alternative a nutritional source to the use of conventional fertilizers. Mr. Hirzel, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. Can you see my screen? Can you go into perfect? We can see it perfect. Thank you. You have 15 minutes. Thank you. Let me talk about the use of organic amendments for uh, fruits and and um, vegetables. In the case of Chile, uh, the most organic amendments um, are the broiler, uh, broiler manure, turkey, and uh, pork uh, compost, or called uh, uh, bio-stabilized. This is the nutritional composition of these amendments. We have all the essential elements required by plants, and similar to the plant requirements in some cases. In other cases, we have some uh, ratios which are not adequate, but can be supplemented with the use of uh, conventional nutrients. So this would be a very good source uh, for our crops. The problem is in the nitrogen release. Uh, nitrogen, unlike other elements, will be modulated by the fractions of this nitrogen in the amendment. Organic, labile, or short, or, or short chain, or non-labile, or long chain, which is, uh, and then uh, the uh, ammonium or nitrate, uh, which depends, uh, depending on the amendment, could be between five to twenty percent. And then the, or the labile organic pole, if it's fresh or composted, it could be range between thirty to up to eighty percent. And this has to be measured. And then uh, with the plant, uh, the, the, the plant response at the, in, in, out in the field. When we, when we control this in the lab, when not knowing the effect, uh, we can suspect these amendments could uh, make the, uh, the soil more acidic. And this is a sand uh, soil and the granitic. Working with different uh, amendments. Blue is to control. Red is the f conventional fertilizer. It is urea at 100 p parts per million. These are lab uh, incubated soils. And green, three amendments, a broiler. That's turkey. And uh, this is uh, biostabilized, which is a compost of pork. And uh, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a composition with uh, pork waste. When the use of conventional fertilizers, uh, conventional fertilizers have a greater uh, acidic effect. And the acidic effect of organic amendments would be a myth because it's not happening as such. The organic amendments are uh, part of that contribute to salinity of the soil or elect, uh, electric conductivity. As we see that when working with conventional fertilizer with the same uh, contribution of uh, Phosphorus or uh, nitrogen, uh, the same concentration of nitrogen of the other uh, rest amendments. Uh, phosphorus and potassium are difficult to equalize. Most electric conductivity is created with the use of conventional fertilizers. Even though the level of organic amendments show or electric conductivity, as here we have electric conductivity, conventional uh, fertilizers, when, when, when in contact with water, will release more ions much faster. And on the other hand, organic amendments, uh, whether you put in the, they will release a carbonated excretes, uh, and this will precipitate it and will create stable salts. Uh, so therefore, the iron concentration and will re it will decrease the, con the electric conductivity for nitrogen release. Uh, in, in red, urea, and when first the incubation is a little release, and in a week or two, will reach the peak, and it remains above the nitrogen of the other amendments, which is true for both soils. In the case of broiler manure, which is fresh, the release is much faster. And this is nitrate in the amendment. Then there's an increase, which is the mineralization of the or of labile organic pool. In this case, a turkey. Uh, manure and the compost it, which will release nitrogen more, more slowly. So the release will be much more controlled and behaves uh, as a control release uh, nitrogen fertilizer. For phosphorus, the release is quite similar uh, compared to conventional phosphorus. Would, 
uh, for, for compost, we have a greater uh, release because we have a greater concentration of phosphorus in the composted uh, amendment. And these, when um, they join the, the soil, are digested by the microbial biomass and different compounds are released. Organic acids, uh, phenolic uh, com uh, carboxylic compounds, um, and that will release a native phosphorus and it will allow us to release, it will increase the release of phosphorus into the soil. Potassium release is quite similar, especially, uh, and, and so these amendments will be a great contribution of uh, potassium and phosphorus. And for nitrogen, we'll have a modulation of uh, release. Now, if we go to uh, clayish, uh, uh, soil, measuring the electric conductivity and pH, the effect is the same. For the ni available nitrogen release in the two types of soils, again, we have a similar effect. With the conventional has a much faster release than a broiler manure, turkey manure, and the bio-stabilized or, or compost of these uh, uh, pork industry. So we need to know the, the speed of the organic portion release of the, for the nitrogen. We have to measure how much nitrogen available there is uh, so as to discount that from the calculation. Then we assess the delivery speed and for this amendment, there is a 60% on average of a delivery of this organic pool. These will allow us to classify these organic amendments and from the nitrogen uh, contribution point, point of view to use that as a fertilizer. This total nitrogen is a function of the inorganic at time zero. This is ammonium and nitrate plus the organic uh, portion, which will be mineralized. And this mineralization in, uh, in uh, one year will be much slower for green, for for, for leguminous, uh, a bit higher in compost, uh, 25 to 4 percent. And uh, for cattle or broiler or turkey manure, and uh, for pork is a 90 percent for pork uh, manure. If we run an example with 20 tons per hectare, have a broiler manure, fresh, 40% moisture. When discounting moisture, we have 12,000 kilograms of dry matter. Now, if we analyze the nitrogen of the dry matter, remember the total nitrogen is a 3%, 0.5 is available, and 2.5 is organic. <clears throat> so this is the difference. We can calculate the contribution of net nitrogen for the same time of application. This total nitrogen into the crop will be equivalent to the inorganic fraction plus the organic fraction, which is being mineralized. 12,000 kilograms of dry weight times 0 0.005, and the release would be 60. And then organic fraction, which will be 2.5% uh, of the dry weight, release is 60%, considering the values uh, I've shown here. So we multiply that, and the, and the release is 180 kilograms of nitrogen during uh, two to three months after the application of the amendment, which will mean 240 kilograms of, of uh, nitrogen per hectare, and that's a net hydrogen release. And then we can build the dosage tables per crop, per, uh, per species, as a function of the organic amendment we'll be working on. Now, for application in uh, annual, uh, first, we do the preparation of soil, uh, the application of the manure, and then the second uh, uh, process and, and seeding. And then uh, there will be a period of time between 7 and 15 days. So as to a proper uptake of the nutrients, a good distribution, and avoid the risk of a phytotoxicity because of a, a localized buildup of amendment. Now, for for early application, that is way before uh, seeding, we do uh, spring seeding, for instance, and we apply uh, this in, in uh, winter or, or, or autumn or fall. We'll have a rainfall that will wash part of the nitrogen, uh, depending on the amendment and the intensity of the rain. Some sulfide or some, su some sulfur and if the sulfur is lost so as a gas, then we have the first uh, greening and then the seeding. 
the several months in between, so we could have some loss of nitrogen and the, 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 the sulfur depending on the texture of the soil. And that loss may be calculated for these type of application so as to determine how much we need to apply to meet the requirement of our species. This is an ex uh, application, ex species for fruits. This is kiwi. This is, uh, this is the drip irrigation. We have the amendment before uh, losing the leaves to capture volatile compounds. And the carbon will uh, uh, attach, will enter the soil. This is an open uh, trench. We apply the amendment. Then it's covered, as seen here, or in the areas where there is no rain. This is a, uh, we, 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 we dig a, a, a square, we place the drippers, we irrigate, there is a decomposition. Probably there will be no growth of uh, root systems, but over the time this will be degraded, will form, will create the soil in the two or three years. This will be full of roots. This is the amendment application and for apples. That's how well the root uh, grows before losing the leaves. This, this is broiler manure. And this is, these are the leaves. So we capture the volatile compounds which are released. This is an application uh, uh, machine, seven to uh, uh, 10 hectares uh, per day the width of uh, 10 to 12 meters. This is a big uh, machine for uh, fruit uh, fields in the, for the areas where we want to apply such amendment. This is uh, cranberries. This is an excess application. This is fully covered. This is an excess of application. These could create phytotoxicity in the plant. This are at the bottom here. This is the residual effect of accumulation from the previous year. Here, this is, uh, I work uh, with the INIA here in Chile. We put the amendment in the previous season, then the amendment was applied uh, and went through the different treatment, and there was an accumulation, a buildup. The next year, this this is maize. This had the depth here is between 20 to 40 centimeters. And here we see the effect of a growth again. Um, as, as a waste, uh, as a residue of the amendment from the last season. This is the, these are the benefits of this amendment for building this soil. Then, but knowing the delivery rate of nutrients, especially for nitrogen, we build these uh, reference tables uh, for fruits, for different crops, for vegetables, for prairies. This is a couple of examples, different uh, fruit species performance, nutritional need for nitrogen in kilograms per ton to be produced. This may change depending on the genotype. And then depending on the type of amendment, uh, if it's a fresh uh, semi-composite or composted, what would be the dosage to be applied to meet this nitrogen requirement associated to the requirement, to the performance? If a lower performance, we use less dosage. If it's a greater performance, we use a greater dosage. If it's intermediate, we can figure out what's the necessary dose uh, to be applied for each one of these uh, species. Similar here. Uh, the, the, these are performance, these are vegetables, depending on the genotype, the amendment we could use, a fresh semi-composite or composted, and the dosage to be used for each amendment as a function of the performance to be obtained in the, with these vegetables. And uh, this is the end of my presentation, and I to thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Herzl, and for showing the nutritional value of amendments, but also uh, discussing the considerations in terms of the different care for good application and leverage of organic amendments. Thank you very much. Three brief messages before we continue. I would like to invite you to participate in an active manner. Please write your questions and comments on the chat, be it in YouTube or here in Zoom. 
please show, tell us your name and who you want to direct your question to. And for the people that are presenting, please do continue with the chat because here we already have uh, already questions in the chat and we can maybe answer them uh, while we're here in this debate. Don't forget to comment in the social networks of the event for, about sustainable agriculture and biofertilizers. We will comment, uh, we want to comment that we have more than 1,500 ex people here. Thank you everybody for being here with us. After these announcements, I would like to give the floor to Leonardo Callas, official of agriculture, specialist in, uh, in vegetables and all in legumes, and he's a member of FAO. You have 15 minutes for your presentation about the rotation of crops and, 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 and intercropping. You have 15 minutes, please. I cannot share my presentation. Don't worry. If you want, we can share it ours for you. I don't see the button here to be able to share it. I had it before. Don't worry. We will share it for you. I can do, I, I already saw the button, I can share it myself. Thank you very much. Can you please change it to presentation mode? Thank you. That's perfect. I'm sorry because of this little delay. Good afternoon. Like Ana said, I am Teodaro, Teodardo Calles. I have a short presentation, unfortunately. I don't have so much time, but I hope that it is very interesting for you. Uh, we have spoken about many things now, but I always try to do a summary of the main challenges that we have nowadays facing. We have a huge population and the population grows. And the people that work in agriculture, we can see, we always think, how can we produce more food to be able to cover this need? As we know, we have here an issue with water and land, which makes agriculture a little bit harder. We have here the climate change impact as well. Many times, uh, because of this, we lose crops. Since now we have a hot climate in India and the quantity of grains that they lost were was significant and also through how we have developed agriculture in the last years decades we, we have lost resilience to the uh, production systems and what attracts us here today what are the rising of the agriculture inputs not only fertilizers but also other inputs that have risen their prices and it makes agriculture production harder. When I say the systems, how they were working today, we can see in this graph to have an intensive farming system. I'm sorry, this graph is in English. What do we need for these systems of intensive farming? We need natural resources, which are the ecosystem services. And also we have based the systems in a huge quantity of agricultural inputs that we need for production. This has caused a rise in biomass and the production of biomass and has also risen the number of negative externalities, soil contamination, loss of water, the quality of water as well. And we have only a few positive externalities. When we have a more integrated system, we want to use most of the natural recourses of the ecosystem services when we use 
for example, in the case of intercropping and crop rotation, and we use more of this ecosystem services, and we use less input. This can lead to have a similar production or even a higher production. But what do we gain there? We gain the fact that the um, negative externality is lower because the use of this chemical inputs reduce and has then as a result positive effects, which is more soil density, a better quality of the soil, and generally speaking, a lot of positive aspects for the environment. What are the, what are the alternatives that we have, that we always have, and so far we have natural systems. We bring a few products from uh, the forests, and these systems have a small, low production, like we can see here in this left graph on the upper bar. We have also a high production here, but has a negative influence in all of the other characteristics of the system. We propose then a system that can be sustainable with ecosystem services which are sustained and maybe the production is not so high as the intensive system but it can be covered and we can maintain natural resources as well well what are the alternatives i'm going to go quickly over these the alternatives to be able to face the fertilizer crisis it is the use of manure, the use of compost, using the resources for crops and also the use of warm compost and also the use of fixing plants of nitrogen like legumes. It is important to say that this is not huge list. And the only list, there are other methods as well, but I consider these the most important ones. In the case of legumes, we have many practices. I'm going to mention only two today, the rotation of crops, which is the practice that in the same place, we alternate two types of crops, normally a crop that is first, which extracts a huge quantity of nutrients from the soil, like a maize, like wheat, and cereals and after we seed plant these ones we do uh, we plant legumes afterwards which allows the soil to recover its fertility in the case of intercropping they both of crops both crops are there but the result is the same the legumes in, help to improve the soil fertility. Here we can see how this would be. And the left, it is we see a maize crop, and on the right, we see a bean crop. And in this case here, we see intercropping in Africa where we plant maize with peanut. It is important to mention here, in the case of nitrogen fixing, like Dr. Maria Angela mentioned, it is a lot of species. Some are have a need to be planted, so we have to see, depending on the which plant we choose, we have to add an inoculant to be able to meet with the objectives that we have, which is the fixing of nitrogen by the plant. What are the advantages of the crop rotation, which is the fixing of nitrogen? Like many of um, other colleagues mentioned before, it fixates nitrogen, which means that it improves the quantity of nitrogen on in the soil. 
some of them also improve the qual the quantity of, phos of phosphorus that is in the soil, present in the soil. And when plants go back to the earth, they, they then liberate the phosphorus. It also maintains and improves the content of organic ma matter. For example, the small farmers that only plants maize and he loses his crop, he loses all of it. But if he seeds or plants his crop with two different things, for example, with intercropping, he can lose the maize, but he can still have legumes to be able to collect and also increments biodiversity of the soil. And which something important is the fact that when we rotate breaks cycles of plagues and diseases and the farmer needs a smaller quantity of products of inputs to be able to protect their plants from plagues and diseases. The disadvantages, many people or many farmers are already used to a cycle of a certain plant and sometimes it is not easy for them to combine two species or three species and, and depending on which rotation they want to do. And in many cases, it might require more quantity of machinery to be able to do the seeding or plowing or, or more than what they needed originally when they did just one single crop. They will now need more when we when he wants to introduce more species to the crop and sometimes also um, more workforce. In the case of intercropping, we have almost the same advantages. The only difference is that it improves production because if we compare the production of legumes with cereal with the production of cereals and legumes when they are in a monocultive, the production improves and we use more uh, the resources in a better way. We, ha we have the same area and we produce in the same area both crops using the same resources of water, light, energy, and we can use these resources in a better way. And the disadvantages requires more knowledge, also the quantity of machinery available. The machinery is not so explained here, but maybe in a small scale farmer that does intercropping in a small area, he can collect it by hand, but when we're talking about a bigger area, maybe they should, they have to change the system to be able to use machines for this. And so next slide, what, how are, are these production systems used? Or where are they used? The crop rotation, we know that it has been used for a long time now, for in our ancient times, uh, we're talking about the Fertile Crescent. I don't know the translation to Spanish. And there in the Fertile Crescent, there is evidence that in that back then they would plant legumes with cereals. It is used in many parts of the world now, still, but it is very well integrated with the agriculture, European and North American agriculture in Canada and in the United States. In Canada, we have a very good example about the use 
of the rotation of crops to improve the soil, the quality of the soil. The intercropping it also has been used in ancient times. We knew the Native Americans used to use we used to plant what they were what they would call the three sisters they would uh, pumpkin with uh, beans and maize and in many places now they're used they use the three sisters but in a small scale the effects on the soil we have already mentioned many of them the improvement of nitrogen and phosphorus it improves the conservation of water in the soil better efficiency it, better use of the fertilizers because if you use it maybe you don't need to use the fertilizers that much in the case of the intercropping it improves the productivity it improves the accumulation of organic um, carbon and those would be the main if positive effects on the soil. The quantity of nitrogen that could be fixed, it is difficult to estimate. We have different studies related to this. We, from small quantities of 72 kilos and studies that mention over 350 kilos of nitrogen by hectare per year, it depends on the different species that are planted and also of the like Dr. Maria Angela mentioned, and also depends on the type of inoculant that we have of this plant and also of the agroclimate conditions. We know that the same species may be in drier soil or more humid soil, they will fix different quantities of nitrogen. to check if this is used by other crops. There were studies that does prove that they were used, but to be able to determine an exact number, it is difficult, it's not so easy. Here on the right-hand side of the picture of the right-hand side, we have a few lots where in the back side from the hand of the person till all the way back we don't have legumes and on the front part of his hand we does have and here we see how the front part is much greener than the back part of the lot and we then see that the it is using the nitrogen that is being fixed by the legume that is planted. This also depends on many factors, how much are, is going to be used by the crop that is that has the legume planted. What are then the challenges and the possibilities for these types of systems? We have a lot of challenges because of labor force, for example, a machinery, like I said, here we see an intercrop of a legume with maize. In these cases, to be able to do, uh, to collect it in, um, in a mechanical way, if we do it, we do what it is called a, an intercropping in trenches or we or we can adapt the uh, harvest with a band or a belt and uh, this is, depends also on the development of machinery for this we have it would be ideal to adapt it to the systems and the locals condition. We know how this works, but we have to check the condition of its region, maybe investigate a little bit to see the, the needs of each region. Specifically, we need also su governmental support to be able to promote these types of systems. And also we need to see the value chain, because many people see this crop because they can sell it, 
the leg legumes that you do not sell it. So we have to see how do we improve the chain of value of these small scale farmers that maybe want to use these type of systems. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope I didn't pass my 15 minutes. Thank you, Eduardo, especially because you're giving us ideas of the need to see the agro uh, system, uh, agriculture system in a, a huge, in a better way, and how we contribute not only to the nutrition of the vegetable, but also the nutrition of the soil, and everything is integrated in a system. Thank you very much. In closing the first block, we will give the floor to Mr. Francis Ray, who's a consultant of BioM, who will present the case commercial production of biofertilizers, uh, BioM experience in Peru. You have 15 minutes. Please, uh, uh, if you could set your presentation in the presentation mode. For some reason, I cannot set the presentation mode. Or you can stop sharing and then restart it, or we can uh, share the screen and the presentation on our side. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. We we'll always have a glitch. It, it's a it's a pleasure, and I'd like to thank you for sharing this presentation with you. The experience of my wife and I in twenty in twenty years in Peru working on uh, fluid or liquid fertilizer with uh, efficient uh, microorganism. Let me share my ex my experience from three points of view. One. As a son of a farmer uh, from Honduras in the in northern Honduras in Colón, I grew up in the field, uh, working in the field. Now I got a scholarship to go to uh, Costa Rica. I'm an agronomist and I'm a consultant uh, in Peru and Bolivia. So let me share with you my experience as a consultant as an advisor and of course my perspective as a, as a, as as as, a, as an entrepreneur we uh, grow mangoes with my wife uh, for expert we use a technified uh, uh, irrigation techniques and we also have uh, avocado crops uh, the has uh, variation working with uh, big producers in Peru our dream for 20 years has been to recover fertility of soils and reduce the use of agrochemicals why we are what we eat we all understand that if you live in Peru if you eat a salad and you add tomato, probably you have 35 applications of fungicides, uh, dermatocytes, uh, uh, broccoli, uh, 28, uh, uh, strawberry, 32. So there is a big problem in the current model. So it's important to understand that this has not been the case for 40,000 years. I mean, we have never used uh, insecticides as have been we using them during the last 40 years. And so health of over 30 million Peruvians, the health of the population around the world depends on the agricultural model. 90% of the immune system uh, is in the digestive system. And that the way, that's how uh, uh, products are grown. If we use fertilizers and pesticides that in Peru, where I will be focusing nearly 90% of the soils are degraded with compaction, salinity, organic matter loss. So definitely we need a change into a model that would be more sustainable. And for that, we have to go back to basics. This is a wonderful 
slide from FAO. I use it in, in every in, in every presentation. I actually print this a a teaspoon of uh, of healthy healthy soil has more or living organisms than people on the planet, bacteria and fungi. A teaspoon of uh, of uh, healthy soil has over 7,000 bacteria and fungi, which are responsible for fertility. We have we have plain the fixation of nitrogen, solubilization of um, phosphorus, mobilization of potassium, and other minerals. The second concept uh, to this uh, slide is that the soil should not see the sun. If you go to a forest, the forest will close the canopy so as to prevent uh, the sun. Let me use this. Uh, the main uh, the main killer of microorganisms in the soil is the sun, of course, uh, besides uh, agrochemicals, meaning that the soil should not be exposed to some poor practices such as excessive mechanization, burning and everything, made the soils to quickly degrade. So, it's important here, again, to remember that in thousands of years, uh, Agriculture has been around 14,000 years. The man has always collaborated with Mother Earth. This has changed in the last 40 to 60 years, where we have changed the model into a model dependent on, uh, on fungicides, insecticides, pesticides, which has led to a food insecurity where most countries cannot produce unless they use uh, external inputs, which has not been true in the history of mankind. The air we breathe today, 78% of nitrogen cannot be fixed into the soil, so through microorganisms. This was a discovery made by the Japanese uh, scientists with whom we worked in over 145 countries, uh, Teru Higa, a revolution to save the earth through microorganisms. And basically what he found was the same thing in the slide of FAO. Fertility of the soil depends on microorganisms, but the effect, the synergistic effect, is really the main benefit. That is, when microorganisms work together, that's the power for regeneration. That's the power to quickly recover fertility of soils and nutrition of crops. So we have a tool, to a low cost, uh, affordable uh, and available in, 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 in over 140 countries, M EM1 as a, as a microbial inoculant, which combines several natural microorganisms to to make a biological correction in the soil and having fertile soils, healthy soils, if I may, I'm producing food and to to uh, solve these crises we're all facing in Latin America. I will not elaborate on this. Microorganisms are responsible for the soil fertility. I always explain producers, if you leave a, a soil to rest for 10 years and you go back uh, and and, 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 and the, the crop will be huge because we have nitrogen fixation, solubilization of phosphorus, mobilization of potassium, growth of roots, better absorption of nutrients, and that will allow for better production in a smaller footprint. In a f we have to double the production, the world production of food uh, in a few years. We have to produce more food in the same uh, surface area and returning many of these uh, surface areas uh, which are not adequate for agriculture to turn it back to forest and being more efficient in those areas which are already being used. Let me show a couple of uh, big farms in Peru more than 300 biofactories in the big uh, farms in Peru and thousands with uh, small producers. This is a snapshot of producer of uh, 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 a double, double Murdoch and then Tangelos uh, for export. And we use the biofertilizer with three main requirements uh, to, with the small and uh, big producers. First has to be practical. Easy. This is a bio. This is a fluid biofertilizer using EM1 as a microbial inoculant, and it takes 10 minutes. 50 kilograms of of uh, blackstrap molasses. No equipment needed. Just the mixing of uh, blackstrap molasses, 
which is a source of energy to activate microorganisms. And we could use, in this case, a ceramica soil, five kilograms. This is like a, a flower, a, a, a rock flower. Uh, we pr do create a anaerobic fermentation, quite similar to a yogurt or, or wine or beer. And um, the cost per liter is 50 cents to a dollar. That's a technology that was quite simple and very cost effective, high quality, and is ready in five to seven years to be applied. At the, uh, the leaves at a foliar level, we add this, add that to water, one to two percent uh, dilution, mixed with any uh, product, can be applied through the soil. In 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 in, uh, in Peru, we use drippers. They would use in drench <coughs> and, and gravity. This is the measuring the quality. A good biofertilizer is an anaerobic fermentation. There's a catabolic. A catabolic uh, system. I have a, 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 a acid pH in, in, in five days. It's it's, uh, it's a ready, simple, practical, replicable acid pH. That's so we have primary, secondary metabolites. Uh, uh, it's uh, very safe. The acidic uh, pH will not uh, will not have growth of coliforms. Only beneficial microorganisms. We use. Reused uh, tanks at 1,000 liters. This is one is uh, 1,000, 5,000. It's a big one. Just for the farm, we're not selling. This is a big farm. That's that's uh, me. One of the last visits, I found the picture of 2010 when I started working with them. This is uh, this is a 2022. You look at the we went from 45 tons up to 90 tons. But now, using less money, 40% less inputs, it's pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, and fertilizers, and the export quality has increased. Uh, for this presentation, I talked to the owner. They don't receive many visitors, and now they are a 93% export quality. More production, less cost, better quality fruit. So. This is a technified irrigation. This is an orange. There we apply a strategy with the result. There it's not just the application of the biofertilizer, actually the application of a comprehensive strategy, very simple, called the six M's in Spanish. Um, microorgan the, the first uh, microorganisms, uh, blackstrap, molasses, and minerals. Organic matter, uh, we, we, we we were not using the leaves. Uh, these were taken aside and they were burned because they, were, they thought that, that there was um, a pathogenic microorganism, which is not so. In organic matter, they only have a, a, a decomposition of organic matter and then we become in, in, in nutritious uh, matter. So we add uh, manure, uh, cow manure, at a very low price here in the area, uh, mulch. That me emphasize mulch here. It's it's critical for agriculture in modern agriculture, keeping the the soil covered. Remember, the soil should not see the sun. Technical management. We use a technified uh, irrigation uh, uh, drippers, uh, uh, pruning uh, sensors. We have put together the knowledge, the, the ancient knowledge and the modern technologies, which allow us to recover physical fertility, the, the physical fertility and the chemical fertility. Every year the soil has been improved, has been, in, has been improving. What we do is back to the basics, a, a symbiosis with uh, nature, as it's always been the case. We have to recover common sense. This is uh, uh, cocoa. This is in the jungle area in Peru. We work with the coffee and cacao. We're using here the strategies of the six M's. And here we add the simple practical knowledge, uh, very, uh, the five S's. This is uh, the best leverage of uh, sun photosynthesis, native uh, trees, indigenous trees, they will offer timber, and these use the sun. Then we have the crop, which is cocoa, and this is a young uh, crop. And then we have a living coverage, which will fix the nitrogen and will protect the soil from the sun. We're using shading because 
the soil is covered. We obtain the best potential from the soil. These uh, trees will reach where the root of the uh, coal will not reach. So these nutrients are taken to the leaves. Those are minerals that when degrading, these may absorb the, by the culture. So the, it's just, uh, the, the, the depth of these trees are much longer than, the, the, much deeper than the, the, the crop. We're using a farmer's uh, wisdom, which has been lost. We need to recover that. The knowledge of our, of our, of our grandparents used common sense, uh, I always say that. And that if you know nothing about agriculture, go to a forest and look at how nature works. In a forest, the sun will not reach the soil. The soil should not see the sun. Microorganisms are sun sensitive. The, the using herbicides is the word thing that will allow for the uh, soil to be naked. As much as possible, let's leave the soil alone. This could be for big farms. I work in Peru and Bolivia. This is a simple technology, practical, cost-effective, that allows for faster results. This is a farm two hours from Lima, 800 uh, 100, uh, cows. Um, we do, we build the bio, uh, liquid biofertilizers. We apply uh, through the uh, gravity irrigation system. This is no dripper. This is now technified. Every once in a while, there's a 20 to 30 hectares to uh, for that's corn. Uh, this we're up. Uh, these are the result. Of these uh, farms. That, I mean, they've received uh, several visitors. So they went from 25 tons. Uh, they went to 40 tons. So use no chemical. No, no chemical fertilizers. They use a cow manure out of 800 manure. We have been working for 15 years with this farm. We produce a sweet potato because of the corn crisis. They need corn. So we produced a yellow sweet potato for cows. These cows are fed with a sweet potato and, uh, and, 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 and corn grass. We went from 28 liters. Uh, from 26 liters to 31 liters, so better quality uh, milk and lower cost. This is a this is a, a farm. You still using a face mask. So we're making a comparison here. Let me compare why uh, EM or why biofertilizers with EM. Why that is uh, an alternative which may be replicable for for smaller and bigger producers. I went to the John, John F. Kennedy Agricultural School, and in 1995, we, they talked about uh, bile, but this has not been well, just not been well received by producers because producers they want faster solutions. Cost is higher because we have to include labor, which is the mystic that the traditional bile has no cost. Of course, there is a cost because there are hours uh, uh, spent. Uh, that is a, a, that nasty uh, smell. The pH is high, risk for coliforms. And uh, in the traditional uh, bile, we use rumen, uh, uh, coconut water, uh, uh, blackstrap, molasses, uh, uh, manure, but this is uh, this is an alternative uh, compared to uh, uh, biofertilizer with EM. It's a five to seven days, lower cost. It's just a nice smell, high concentration of amino acid, that simpler for the producer. We're working with the big farms for avocado in Peru. We increased uh, production by twenty percent. We reduced cost in agrochemicals by thirty percent in most cases. Of course. This will improve every year. That is, every year we'll have to reduce the dosage of fertilizers. These are very uh, fertilizer-intensive crops. So one of the greatest uh, producer of uh, vegetables for supermarkets. We have 10 tanks here, 10,000 liters every five days. They, they that's a tomato, lettuce, uh, uh, celery. But they're not organic. These are not organic crops. The use of fertilizers and agrochemicals is nearly 50% lower, and we have a better yield and better quality product. This is another farm. There are no 
motors, no electricity. No, all I need is reused clean tanks. I can start a bio factory of liquid bio fertilizers with twenty dollars. This is a picture. Uh, this was uh, last uh, Thursday in Santa Cruz. Uh, we they, they manage uh, uh, soy uh, hectares. Uh, this is a uh, sorghum. That's a uh, 45 days of drought. Uh, yet the, the sorghum is in perfect conditions compared to other sorghums in the area without biofertilizer. Why? We have a better root growth. Uh, more. Pro, pro, a bigger population of mycorrhizae, better absorption, better uptake of water and nutrients. A tomato producer, lots of uh, wisdom. Uh, they're not organic tomatoes. These are tomatoes where we use less input. The dosage of fertilizers is around 30% in fertilizers and agrochemicals. And we have a better quality tomato. We have celery. Yeah, it's in the Peruvian desert uh, using technified uh, irrigation. We have a better yield, lower costs. We also work with smaller producers of coffee in Peru and cocoa. In, in, as I said, all they need is a cylinder this day with a, with a, of this type of, with, a, with a lid. And then we do the mixing no more than five to ten minutes. And in five days, this thing is ready. Uh, one uh, microbial in, inoculant EM, uh, um, black strap molasses, and uh, rock flower. Uh, we could use uh, foliar soil if there is no uh, no dripping uh, irrigation. We could use trenches. This is Copagro explaining the producers how to build the biofertilizer with this drum. And this, of course, the manager or the responsible for the cooperative, which is the biggest one, we started, we started to install these uh, 35 uh, biofactories. And this is being, uh, and, 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 and this is the, uh, the leaf uh, canopy. Leaf. This is a family meeting, as I call it. The family can work in this biofertilizer. This is natural. This is safe, uh, nice smell. It's like a ferment. This is for cocoa. This is we're adding with the agricultural oil, one liter per pump, uh, so as to obtain a better re field response. We could uh, apply at the drench. This is Bruno, responsible for the technical side of the cooperative. Well, that's uh, one of the persons that has allowed this for grow. In other region in Peru, uh, that uh, cocoa and, and, and uh, this has been affected by livestock. Uh, we've been working for ten years for the big producers, and uh, the, that's that's the answer. This is the result. This is northern Peru, one of the big farms, asparagus. Um, and uh, this is a biofactory version of um, these are the responsible for each one of the areas, nearly 10, 20 tanks applied to the soil, like an organic amendment in order to improve, enhance the quality. They have salinity and that nematodes uh, issues. We have solved the, the problem in a very cost effective, very practical manner, the, the treatment with biofertilizers. Uh, no nematode issue, it was a bigger root growth, better uptake of water, better uptake of nutrients. This is this is me in red with a, without a face mask with the producers in Peru. This is a big growth of grapes uh, for a nematode control, a soil control, for compaction, salinity issues. Banana producers, this is in northern Peru, bordered with uh, Ecuador, organic banana, and uh, as part of uh, biofertilizers, even though I've explained the simplest way of doing it, which is mixing uh, uh, blackstrap molasses and water and microorganisms, depending on the type of soil, I can go one step further. In, 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 in I can add some minerals. So since the uh, pH is acid, you improve uh, the chelating effect. In Bolivia, we're using uh, cobalt, uh, moly, nickel, uh, uh, with a wonderful result in soybean to promote the development of microorganisms to fix the nitrogen. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Reyes, we have only one minute. Then, yeah, I'm, I'm about to close. Uh, and this is uh, with uh, coffee producers. 
en uh, Chancha Mayo, uh, San Fernando, one of the biggest uh, broiler uh, um, farm. This is for laying hands. Uh, this is my farm, mangoes. This is the second harvest. We're using mulch, if you see there. Of no problem of, of growth of, of, of bad wheat. We use technified, uh, technified uh, irrigation. And these are the happiest uh, moments of life before the pandemic with my 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 wife and my daughter. Uh, we worked uh, with lots of mulch. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, you let me know. So I believe there is an alternative which is affordable, which is sustainable, that will allow farmers to have uh, fast results, which is what we're looking for. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Regis, for emphasizing several things in, in your presentation, uh, agroecological practices and the results, which is reducing as part of that, the use of uh, conventional fertilizers and, and, and inputs, availability of this type of technology, which are applicable to small and big uh, producers, the role of the soil, the importance of biodiversity of soil, and especially the importance of uh, having a good management of soil in, 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 in agricultural practices. And in a way, I believe that emphasizes the impact of climate change with the uh, temperature increase when you're having them bare naked soils and from that degradation of the other soil but uh, the biodiversity which is important for nutrient uh, bioavailability i'd like to thank all the panel uh, members for their presentations that makes us reflect on the importance of biofertilizers, other alternative technologies and that allow us to learn this wide diversity. We didn't show everything, it's just an overview on um, these uh, solutions we're looking forward to face, these uh, uh, more expensive uh, fertilizers for a better life and a better environment. We have received many, many questions out of uh, 1,600 people listening through the different uh, platforms. Well, we don't have much time to take them all, but uh, we will review them uh, and, and, and try to address them. There is a particular question for Maria Angela, if possible, whether the strains used uh, for maize may be used or adapted to any type of soil, climate, and elevation. Mariangela. Yes, that's really interesting. And theoretically, we always believe that microorganisms is better to adapt it to the original environment. But there are some exceptions. Beans, uh, for instance. The strain, the, the best strain in Brazil, Africa, and many places around the world was taken from Colombia, from the, the mountains of Colombia. And, uh, and the, it was seven. And on the other hand, the Pedicidium pili, which was uh, very good for phosphorus, and was isolated from Canada. Here in Brazil, it did, just didn't work because it's from is for cold environment. So each microorganism has a different uh, response. The Australian Brasilensis for maize, for wheat. In Brazil, in, especially in Rio Grande, where it's colder, uh, up to near the Amazonas. So uh, the, the, we're we don't we don't we, we know very little about micro microorganisms. We have to try, and uh, the Azospirillum, of course, uh, it has been very successful in different sites. Uh, thank you, Mariangela. Juan Ircel, you talked about phytotoxicity, and the question is, what's the reason for phytotoxicity when you assume it's an organic product, which is stable, and therefore it is assumed that has no negative consequences? Okay, for phytotoxicity has to do with a poor application, uh, poor distribution, and the amendment is uh, it's concentrated, it's built up in certain points. If we have a good application at the right dosage, with good distribution, 
covering all the all the surface area, the the, the roots, and if it's an annual, we add uh, the amendment, uh, there will be no problem. If it's fruit or established crop, and we apply the amendment on the root area, but at the right dosage and uh, the proper distribution, so as not so as to avoid buildup, they will never will never have. Uh, Toxicity. They are very safe, but if there's a mistake in the application there, you may induce phytotoxicity and uh, then make the wrong assumption that the product is not working. Is there is this a treatment for, for manure? You need some time before the application? No, that depends on the organic amendment used. We work with the fresh amendment uh, to be applied for annual crops between one to two weeks before seeding for, for fruits, for instance. Um, which are a permanent, but just during when when you have a rain water, so that the water can add uh, the fixation of the more soluble elements, it will activate the biomasses to consume the carbonates and release nutrients and build the soil. For those uh, semi-compost or, or or fully compost, that's easier because we can use that closer to the root growth, but. For annual uh, uh, crops, uh, we had suggested two or uh, one to two weeks before, and for fruits, uh, in the period of uh, winter or, or autumn, so as to make sure there is contact with the water, which will facilitate the other nutrients into the soil. Excellent, Mr. Reyes. The nutritional profile of EM1. Now, what's the reason of not using? native microorganism in, instead of the inoculus you, you are using. Well, EM1 is a consortium of uh, beneficial microorganisms. We have acid, lactic, fermentation, photosynthetic, uh, yeast. Uh, that's one alternative. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that, the, 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 of, of course, you, you, you have uh, many alternatives. Both are sustainable alternatives, but EM we know that all the beneficial microorganisms we have, and it's a low cost, uh, the mountain uh, microorganism, it's, uh, it's another alternative. However, making them uh, has a cost. You have to collect the, the microorganism from the, from the forest. You have to buy blackstrap molasses. You have to buy a drum. You have to make the, the, the blending, and that's a labor. Solid fermentation, the, the liquid fermentation, I would like to emphasize that that, uh, that there is a labor cost uh, that it's uh, not considered when we do a wild microorganisms or the traditional bio. And that's the mistake we make because the producer wants with cost effective technologies but fast. Cannot wait for 90 days or 30 days for making wild microorganism. And you have to go to the forest, you have to buy inputs. Our point is an alternative which is practical, simple, and cost-effective. Thank you. I'd like to thank the attendees for your interesting questions, the panel members for your answers. Unfortunately, because of time, we cannot uh, continue answering questions. But as like we said, we will review those questions so, uh, and uh, we'll try to send you the right answers as soon as possible. This has allowed us for a very good exchange on the different alternatives uh, for solving this fertilizer crisis. And uh, as I said before, the, the, the will, this, we will, this has been tape recorded and will be hosted in the different uh, side webs. We have, you have the links in the different chat pods and the presentations will be available for you to uh, revisit this uh, webinar once again. Thanks to those who follow us, we nearly uh, 5, 000, 1,700 people uh, following uh, through uh, FAO's YouTube channel, uh, www.fao.org, and also on fr through our Twitter account uh, uh, at FAO Americas. Uh, thank you all. This is the first blog. And before closing this blog, I would like to join the community of uh, soil practice and, and family uh, uh, agroecology uh, uh, group of practice. We're working on, um, on 
for plant nutrition and, and, and other topics which we'll be developing. Those who are following us on, on Zoom will continue with the second block, which uh, will be discussing catalysts, uh, catalysts and the barriers from the public and private sector for positioning and scaling of uh, biofertilizers and other technology alternatives. But thank you. Thank you all for joining us in this uh, first block.